Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our midweek services and our transformation class. Uh, we certainly give honor to God tonight for bringing us through another week and to another Wednesday night of our classes. We thank God for our beloved Bishop, Bishop Jacqueline E. McCullough. We thank God for your presence, Bishop, your support, your leadership, your love, and your guidance. We thank God for you to our overseer, Overseer Robin Edwards, we honor you tonight, uh, to all ordained personnel and you, the people of God. We're delighted you have stopped by. It's our custom to open up all of our classes uh, with our sanctification confessional. So I will lead you in the sanctification confession tonight. So if you will, with your devices muted, follow along with me before we begin our classes with our confession. Let us begin. I am a sinner saved by grace. I was guilty of sin and I cherished it. My life was a willful offense to God. I didn't want him and didn't care if he wanted me. But despite my depraved existence and my evil and selfish ways, because of his grace and mercy alone, he chose me. My salvation is only because he drew me to himself. I was spiritually dead and he awakened my spirit to be attracted to him. Now he wants me to know him and to have eternal life through him. He wants me to change through the process of sanctification and be more like him. But I have tried and know I am incapable of sanctifying myself. I want to sin because my sin nature is still alive. In my flesh is no good thing. My flesh is hostile towards God. It is an active enemy of God. Nothing I do will sanctify me. Performance, good works, talents, and gifts do not qualify me. I can only be sanctified through his word and truth. I must commit to this process, dying daily to my fleshly ways and ideas. When I embrace the sanctification process daily, it will gospelize my life. I will be a new creature. His death, burial, and resurrection guarantee I really can have a different kind of life. Therefore, I pray for the word to seize my heart, to conquer the filth of my mind, and to capture the longing of my soul. I want to be sanctified. I need to be sanctified, and I am determined to be sanctified. If that's you, just put your hands together wherever you may be, and thank God for the sanctification process. Now, without further ado, and first I'd like to welcome all of you that are joining us on the social media platforms as well. We're delighted that you stopped by. Without further ado, I'll turn it over to our teacher leader for the month of May, none other than our own Reverend Anthony Jackson. Reverend Jackson, it's in your hands. Thank you, Reverend Dr. Trish. Good evening, everyone. We'd like to welcome you to our weekly transformation class. Um, I give honor to God tonight, um, to our bishop, the Reverend Dr. Jacqueline E. McCullough, our overseer, Robin Edwards, all ordained personnel and the people of God. If you're joining us on social media, we trust that the Lord has a word for you tonight. And we thank you for stopping by in our weekly transformation class. Now, this is the last week for our classes, the team that I participated with for this month. Um, the first week we talked about God's choice tools of calamity. I did that class. The second week we had Pastor Angel who talked about the removal of the plague. And tonight we have Reverend Marshall who will be presenting the lesson for you tonight. Thank you for stopping by once again and I hand it over now to Reverend Marshall. Good evening and God bless you. Um, Okay, God bless you. So we're going to just do a very brief review tonight, and I'll get right into the lesson. And the first thing I wanted to do was just at least give you the theme scripture that was covered when Reverend Anthony taught two weeks ago. And the theme scripture comes from the book of Joel, chapter 2, verse 25. And it reads, And I will restore unto you the years that the locust hath eaten, the canker worm, the caterpillar and the palmer worm, my great army, which I sent among you. So far the scripture. 
And what we were discussing was the God's choice tools for calamity. And one of the things that I wanted to do was I wanted to make sure, okay. So one of the things that we, we went over last week, we went over a couple of weeks, the actual locust plague. Okay, so we went in depth on just giving some information on the actual locusts themselves. I'm sure many of you probably remember. We saw an, a great, a very intriguing video on how the locusts actually work. And we showed how, first of all, the locust itself is in the caterpillar family. And in its original state, the, lo the locust is really a solitary insect. So we looked and we saw how powerful the locust is once it becomes, and it shows how, the video showed how the locust goes through various phases. But at a certain point, when the locust is joined with the other locust, it becomes a swarm. So we saw how d detrimental the locust plague was. And the locust plague really undergirds the entire book of Joel, that prophecy. So we did, we went through a lot of information on the actual locust. And the one thing that came up in our study was the fact that the locust plague was a sign of God's judgment. It was a sign of God's judgment because we also know in Exodus chapter 10, verses four through 20, the locust was one of the plagues that God used in Egypt when he was trying to get the attention of Pharaoh. And so we remember God sent 10 plagues to Egypt and each plague was very significant in its own calamity, but the design was to bring Pharaoh to a point of repentance. So we see that it's a sign of judgment, but the purpose is not just to punish. The purpose is to bring repentance. So Pharaoh did not harden his, Pharaoh did not change his ways. He did not repent. And the locusts came and devoured everything that hail would not have destroyed. So they ended up going through a massive devastation in Egypt because of God's judgment. Now, the important thing that we wanted to know from our study is that it was God's choice. And that was something that was very you know, consistent throughout the theme. It was God's choice. And we need to know that because if it's God's choice, then there is no use in trying to rebuke it, okay? The locust plague and the plague that was sent was because God was trying to get the attention of his people. So we see that God did it. It was God's choice. And then we also had a chance to get a good glimpse as to the redemption that will come and the restoration that will come. But in order to really appreciate the restoration, you have to have a full appreciation for the scope of the actual devastation, okay? So we looked at how when the, lo when the locust swarm, a small swarm of locusts, actually would be approximately 80 million locusts consuming about 1.8 tons of vegetation, equivalent to food consumption of 35,000 people. This is major, okay? So we're talking about a massive devastation on an agricultural society. And the interesting thing about the tool or the instrument that God used is that the locusts do not break rank, okay? We see that the locusts go out and they never break rate, a very organized phenomenon that we have no control over, okay? So God used something that the people had no control over to bring about something that was within their control. So the next thing that we see here is we were, Pastor Angel came last week and she actually did a warning against idolatry. And I remember Pastor Angel went very, very, she talked very extensively or mentioned in the review that she did, she asked three very important questions. The first question was, where is our worship? Ladies and gentlemen, worship is important because that's the entire theme that runs through the Bible. God wants our worship. And he said in Exodus chapter 20 and verse three, I will have no other God before me. So we have to make sure that our worship is given to God and it is given to God, not mixed with any idolatry. So she went through what idolatry is when you love anything more than you love God. And actually, to be honest with you, we even talked about the adoration. So sometimes with idolatry, we have to understand that it's also about what we give adoration to. She talked about, you know, the various things that have become idols in our culture, whether it's money, whether it's fame, success, 
um, sex, drugs, anything. And the one thing that I would like to even submit is even our technology, our cell phones have in many ways become something that is a seat of our adoration. So whenever it comes to idolatry, we always want to make sure that we look at the aspect of worship. So she asked us, where is our worship? The next question that she asked is, where is our obedience? What does obedience have to do with worship or idolatry? It has everything to do with worship. We cannot be in proper sense of worship if we're in rebellion to God. So we worship is critical, but obedience is attached to worship. And the scripture that came to my mind is 1 Samuel 15, verse 22 through 23. That's 1 Samuel chapter 15, verses 22 through 23. Here begins the reading of God's holy word. And Samuel said, Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to hearken than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he has also rejected thee from being king. So far the scripture. So this is just one example of how obedience or disobedience caused Saul his entire kingdom. So we have to make sure that when we check our worship, we have to also check our obedience. Are we in rebellion to God? Are we doing what God tells us to do in his word? Or are we in conflict? Because if we are, then we are in the category that scripture calls idolatry, okay? So the last question that Pastor Angel asked was, where is our reverence for God and for the things of God? And that was a very important question because it was, she was just setting up the, the understanding, the context as for idolatry, because we are in a culture that is really, really irreverent. A lot of the things that were sacred to us at one point are no longer sacred. And so when you look at it, our reverence that we have for God and the reverence that we have for, thing, for the things of God is an indication as to whether or not we are falling into idolatry. So these were some very important questions that were asked during the overview last week. And then the one thing that she went into after that was the fact that God will remove the plague that devastated his people. So the removal of the plague was one of the great promises that was discussed last week. And we noticed in order for the plague to be removed, there was a national call for repentance. Joel chapter two, verses 12 through 13. Here begins the reading of God's holy word. Therefore also now saith the Lord, turn ye even to me with all your hearts and with fasting and with weeping and with mourning and rend your heart and not your garments and turn unto the Lord your God for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness, and repenteth him of the evil, so far the scripture. So when we were looking last week at the removal of the plague, the thing that actually would trigger the removal of the plague or the restoration that God promised was the repentance. So the first thing that Joel tells us in this three-part repentance aspect was the repentance must entail fasting and weeping. So there must be a sense of sacrifice, okay? The people had to fast and there was weeping because whenever you have true repentance, there has to be a sense of being sorrowful for the act that was committed against God and against his holiness. So they were commanded for fasting, weeping. And then the prophet also said, rend your heart and not your garment. Why is that important? It's important because even in the culture of ancient Israel, repentance or mourning and, and those types of things had a dramatic aspect to it because they also would have so many ceremonial aspects where they would have the ashes and sackcloth and then the repentance or the mourning will become a dramatic thing. And so what God was saying through the prophet was that what God is requiring is not necessarily what the change that you will see on the outside but God was requiring the change on the inside. So it's your heart that's going to trigger or the heart is going to be the thermometer of how much you are really trying to move in the direction of repentance as opposed to the outward show. 
So even repentance, like I said, even sometimes the things that we do sometimes have more dramatic aspect, but what God was looking for was sincerity. So that's what the prophet called them. And then the last thing he said in that particular passage was that God is gracious and merciful. That is important to us because if God's judgment is so powerful, if his wrath is so powerful, how much greater his mercy towards people. So we have to make sure that we understand that God is gracious, that God wants to forgive and that God is merciful. And this is what Joel was urging the people. God will remove the plague because he is gracious and he is merciful. And because we as a nation, remember, Pastor Angel did talk last week about the aspect of community. There are some things that we do and we're guilty of individually. But there are some things that we have to also look at how we have offended God collectively, okay? So we are in community. When we sin, when we transgress, there are certain things that we do, and God is displeased with the nation. And there are certain things God is displeased with, with, with regions. But God is gracious, and he is merciful. And so that was the theme that was running through the call to repentance. And then what we went into was we went into the promise of restoration, which was in Joel chapter two, verses 21 through 23. We see the promise of restoration impacting Israel on four different levels. The first level of the, of the promise was the land would be restored. God was restoring the land. The second thing that God was restoring was the beast of the field. And then the pastures was the third thing. And then the fourth thing was the children of Zion, the people. So this was a very important, you know, promise that we were discovering or we, that we were mentioning last week. And the reason that this was so important, because God is in the restoration business. This is what God does. And when he does it, he does it well. So it had a domino effect. The land would be restored, the beast, the animals, everything because of the fasting. And I think one thing that was mentioned, Pastor Angel mentioned, I thought it was very important. We are so concerned sometimes with how, you know, plastic and so many, so many trivial things. Now, I'm not knocking environmentalists, but I'm just saying that sometimes we are not always cognizant of the impact that idolatry has whenever we commit any type of idolatry as a nation. And then when God has to send judgment, then the land has to be restored, the beast, everything. So this was a very, very powerful teaching. And so tonight, one of the things that I wanted to do was we're going to pivot to God's protection. Okay, so we're going to be in Psalm 91 because Psalm 91 has a lot of blessings and a lot of things that you will see that will be undergirded through even in jo Joel's prophecy. Okay, so when you think about Psalm 91, one of the things that I wanted to discuss is the fact that the Psalms themselves are a wonderful collection of hymns and praises. And when it comes to how people are going to move out of crisis, remember, we talked last week about moving out. And even as we move out of the pandemic, right, we want to make sure that we are transitioning the right way. Because even though God removed the plague, what's one of the things that was constant in Israel? They would turn away from God. They would go into idolatry or rebellion, et cetera. They would turn away from God, turn their hearts away from God. God would send judgment they will repent, and then God will bring deliverance, and God will restore. So even though God restored, there, it was a cyclical pattern throughout biblical history. Once God delivers us, you know, we go right back to the same thing. we right back in the same situation, and then we cry out to God again, right? Then he, you know, he sends judgment, and it's just a cycle that goes on and on. So one of the things that I wanted to do was just to look at the Psalms and how we can actually come out of one phase, right? And just understanding why God is calling. And throughout scripture, he called for people to actually have more of a devotion to him. So we're going to look at the Psalms tonight. And my hope is that we'll walk away from this particular lesson tonight, understanding some of the benefits that are attached to just being in fellowship or to be in, in right relationship with God, to be in closeness with, with God. So we're just going to look at the Psalms. And, and so I wanted to look at the, you know, so here it is says, after calamity and plague, it is important that we have a renewed sense of commitment to God. Economic and physical devastation can leave us in need of assurance that God will provide sustainability. 
This is when we turn to him. The Psalms is a wonderful book to reference the faithfulness of God throughout generations. So the question is, how do we move out of crisis? Okay, so we want to move out the right way. And I, you know, one of the things that we're going to look at, we're going to look at the Psalms. So just a brief overview so that we can at least understand the context of the passage. Psalms is actually divided up into five major divisions, which will be five actual books of Psalms. The first book is Psalm 1 to 41. The second book of Psalm is Psalm 42 to 72. And the third book is Psalm 73 to 89. Book four is Psalm 90 to 106. Book five is Psalm 107 to Psalm 150. And there are different types of Psalms. You have songs of lament, songs that talk about, you know, how sorrowful we are that we have offended God or we Some look songs. at our you, you know the songs. psalmist looks at you know a certain aspect of the life and there are, there's a lamentation aspect to psalms there are some psalms that are thanksgiving psalms that are just so powerful in the sense that they call for a national call for us to just rejoice and thank God there's some songs that are messianic in nature that are talking about the messiah some songs are historical and then you then you have some songs that are they belong to a category called wisdom literature. But each of these songs belong in the category that they're in. And sometimes that category is not even enough to contain them because they're so powerful. But when we look at the songs, we'll get an idea as to how we are to have fellowship or relationship with God, personal relationship, and how we should have devotion to him. Because isn't that what he wanted from Israel all along? He wanted devotion. He wanted commitment. And so when we look through the Psalms, we get a chance to see how, and most people, when you, when you witness to them or minister to them, a lot of people don't feel comfortable coming to church because sometimes they feel like I don't belong or I have to get my life together. But when you read the Psalms, you actually hear from writers who did not always have it together, but they understood how to prioritize and how to make sure that God was a priority and that God was praised. So when we look through Psalms, we walk away with an understanding that God must be praised, okay? So tonight we wanna just look at Psalms 91. And so I will just read a few verses here. Psalm 91 verses one through four. Here begins the reading of God's holy word. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress. My God in him will I trust. Surely he shall deliver thee from the snare of the fowler and from the noisome pestilence. He shall cover thee with his feathers and under his wings shalt thou trust. His truth shall be thy shield and buckler. So far the scripture. So this particular psalm belongs to the category known as wisdom literature. So when we look at this particular psalm, we get a, a glimpse or something that we can draw from as to the character of God, the nature of God. And we want to make sure that we understand this particular psalm, as I mentioned, is the, even though the psalms are divided into the five books, this particular psalm is in the fourth book of Psalms. And why is that important to us and to our lesson, what we've been talking about? Well, the third book of Psalm, Psalm you know, 73 to 89, you can obviously see in that particular arrangement that there was a crisis, okay? And then by the time they get to the end of that particular book, you'll see that everything is just falling apart in Psalm 88. The writer is saying, and it's one of the saddest Psalms when you read it, the writer is saying, everybody, all my friends have left me. You know, death is my closest companion. And so everything is so dark. But you get the idea that there is a crisis. And the person, the psalmist is actually crying out to God because of the situation. And this crisis, as, they move, as we move into the fourth division of Psalm, the fourth division is actually dealing with how do you respond to crisis? How do we have faith in God? through crisis. And so it opens up with the 90th Psalm itself. Moses is the Psalm of Moses. And Moses is actually saying, God, you are our refuge from generation to generation. So we're looking at the Psalms and you want to always look back at the, the history and the track record of God. 
And so that's what this book is doing for us. You look, you read and you find some Psalms that are personal. And then you find some Psalms that will actually talk about how God preserves his people. And this particular Psalm is a Psalm that deals with security. So we see a lot of powerful imagery here that first of all, it tells us that whosoever, he who dwells in the secret place of the most high shall abide under the shadow. Dwelling is a, is a very important aspect. As we start to move into this new phase, we have to have a sense of dwelling. And dwell, it really means to sit and to remain, to inhabit or to occupy a space. So this is contrasted against the notion of just frequenting or just going in and out, right? So this is what God really wants. He wants people to abide, to remain, okay? And so whenever you dwell, that means you live there, you occupy that space. And there is a place in God that the closer you get to this particular place in God, it's, 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 it's so powerful because you're inhabiting something that is putting you in a position to protect you, right? And so that's a general sense. Now, remember, this is not guaranteed in every sense, but this is a general sense as to how God provides for his people, okay? If you dwell in the secret place, you abide in the shadow of the almighty, okay? So dwelling, right? You wanna be close to God. You wanna make sure that this is not a transactional thing only. Remember, Israel will always run to God when there was a problem. And then once he delivers them, then they will go back. But God is saying, especially the psalmist is saying to us, there is a place in our devotion in God that we are so near to him that there's a certain protection just because of how near we are to God. And that's what he wants. He wants us to, to be in that place where we are in, where we're just inhabitants of that, okay? And remember, I do want to, you know, put this side note in there. You can be in close proximity to someone and still not be near. And so that's what this particular psalm is telling us. It's telling us that if we dwell in that secret place, that that's what's going to happen. And then it is contrasted, as I said, against, you know, frequenting, okay? So God has a secret place. Psalm 27 and five says, for in the time of trouble, he shall hide me in his pavilion, in the secret of his tabernacle shall he hide me. He shall set me upon a rock. Psalm 31 and 20, thou shalt hide them in the secret of thy presence from the pride of man. Thou shalt keep them secretly in a pavilion from the strife of tongues. So this is an example. These are two examples, so far the scripture. These are two examples that God has a secret place that not everybody might take advantage of, but there are blessings associated with that secret place. Psalm 91 echoes the imagery of Deuteronomy chapter 32. We see a generation of covenant people that were not faithful to God. Thus he sent judgment. Yet after the period of judgment was over, there was a season of restoration and blessings. And that's what we were talking about in our lesson for the past you know, two weeks. We were talking about that season. After God judges, after he brings judgment, then there is a season of restoration and blessing. And with this Psalm, we get an imagery as to what we see this Psalm echoing is Deuteronomy 32, 11 through 13, where God is seen as an eagle nurturing its young under the wings and providing ultimate care. So this is not just some random you know, situation here. This is powerful because as we commit ourselves to being near to God, there is a, there is a, a blessing associated with that. And the next few verses that I wanna read would be Psalm 91 verses five through nine. Here begins the reading of God's holy word. Thou shalt not be afraid for the terror by night, nor for the arrow that flieth by day, nor for the pestilence that walketh in darkness, nor for the destruction that wasteth at noonday. A thousand shall fall at thy side and 10,000 at thy right hand, but it shall not come nigh thee. Only with thine eyes shalt thou behold and see the reward of the wicked, because thou hast made the Lord, which is my refuge, even the most high thy habitation. So far the scripture. Now remember, as I mentioned before, and I always want to make sure that I, I, I caution with this. This is not an absolute guarantee that every believer would always, or that we would never experience any harm, right? But what this is, remember I said this is 
This song belongs to the wisdom literature section, which means that there is a general principle here, right? And the general principle is as people, this is how God provides for, and this is how God protects his own. So this is more about an image as to God and his faithfulness towards us. So as you have this type of connection and this type of closeness to God, there is no need to fear, okay? And that's what this Psalm is telling us. And the next few verses that I will read will be Psalm 91 verses 10 through 13. Here begins the reading of God's holy word. There shall no, befall, there shall no evil befall thee, neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling, for he shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. They shall bear thee up in their hands, lest thou shalt dash thy foot against a stone. Thou shalt tread upon the lion and an adder, the young lion and the dragon shalt thou trample under feet. So far the scripture. Psalm 91 was called into question during the testing of Jesus in the wilderness. And why is this important? This is important because first of all, we talked about it. God has protection for his people. But not only does God has protection, but God has protectors, okay? So God has angels that were, you know, it, angels have a very specific role. And according to Hebrews 1 and 14, angels are assigned to minister to those who will inherit salvation. So angels are ministering spirits. There is nothing, and remember in Luke chapter 4, verses 9 and 10, I won't read it, but I'll just paraphrase what what the tempter was telling Jesus was, you know, since you're so protected, why don't you just jump off of this pinnacle here? And the angels will catch you. The angels will, will catch you. And Jesus, and the whole idea here is that even though we have this protection, even though God is with us, we still can't do what we want to do. Coming out of the pandemic, we still have to have an honor and a reverence for God, okay? We cannot, and one of the things the enemy wants to do is he would love to cause people to try to reduce God's word to something frivolous, something that is nonsense, where if you're so protected, just jump. But the, that's not the point. We cannot test God. Angels are not here for some mystical purpose. And we cannot, first of all, angels do not take anyone out of the will of God. And sometimes it is easy for us, if we're not careful, to, to not realize that you can know scripture, but if it's misapplied, then it's of no avail to you. Okay, so angels are not for some mystical purpose. Nothing about God is mystical, okay? We have certain laws and there are certain principles that we must adhere to. And that's what Jesus was saying. Jesus was saying, we don't test God. There are principles. There are we follow certain principles, okay? So just because we have protection doesn't mean that we can do whatever we want to do, okay? So the last few verses that I will read here verses 14 through 16 of Psalm 91. That's Psalm 91 verses 14 through 16. Here begins the reading of God's holy word. Because he hath set his love upon me, therefore will I deliver him. I will set him on high because he hath known my name. He shall call upon me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. So far, the scripture. Now, we do see that in the last lines of this psalm, God speaks personal blessings to the one that is faithful to him. But here is what's interesting. Throughout the other verses, the psalmist is writing and is speaking of God or speaking of the Lord in the second person. But here is what was very interesting. God is now speaking through these verses. God is saying, I will do this, okay? So now God is pledging his own faithfulness and his character in this scenario. So this is about God, okay? And God is saying, I will do this. And why did God say it? Because he set his love upon me. Talking about the person that trusts in God, the person that is near to God. He set his love upon me. And in the Hebrew, what it really means is to attach, OK, so it's really not just about the fact that this person has, a, you know, some affection, but he has attached his affection to me. So remember, we talked about idolatry, adoring and not adoring God. But this particular person has attached their affection to God. That means wherever God is, that's where you are. Wherever God wants to be, that's where you want to be. There is an attachment there because he has set his love upon me. And then here is the other thing it says. It says, because 
He has known my name. Now we have to understand how important it is that we remember the name of the Lord. It says, uh, I believe in Isaiah, some trust in horses and some trust in their chariots, but I will remember the name of the Lord. So we have to make sure that we understand that there is a powerful blessing associated with just being reverent for the name of God and making sure that we remember God in our troubles. So that's what this particular, um, these verses are saying. And here are the types of blessings that were bestowed. The first blessing is a blessing of his presence. I will be with him in trouble. And the second blessing is a blessing of protection. I will deliver him. The next blessing is a blessing of promotion. I will honor him. Isn't that an awesome thing? And then the, the next thing is a blessing of prosperity. And we're not talking about material things here. With long life, I will satisfy him. I believe that there is a satisfaction of having long life. Amen to that. And so the last thing is the blessing of preservation. Okay, and I will show him my salvation. So these song, this particular psalm is powerful when we meditate on it. But the thing that I wanted to make sure that we understand tonight is that once you come out of the cycle, we come out of the, you know, the season, we're in our pandemic. When we come out of that, will we go right back into the same thing? Will we go right into, you know, business as usual? Or will you come out of it and learn, maybe there's a lesson that I can learn from this. Maybe there's something that I can commit myself to, to God on a deeper level and not just from a transactional perspective. So these are the blessings and wanted to just make sure that we went through this because we think it's, I think it's important that everyone understands God will remove the plague. There are certain things that God will do. But then as we do certain things, there is a blessing associated with our commitment to God. So with that, I want to say God bless you and I'll turn it over to Reverend Anthony. My God, my God, can you please give Reverend Marshall a hand clap for tonight? We thank God for that lesson. I don't know about you, but I was blessed tonight to hear the word of God. Um, one, one of the things that really stuck with me is he said, moving from crisis to protection. From crisis to protection. Now, I know some of y'all don't feel like you don't even move. There, there's no movement going on. You say, you know, COVID is still here. Money's still funny. You know, jobs is acting up. There's a lot still going on. But there is a space where you can move from crisis to protection without waiting for COVID to move. You don't, you don't need for your circumstances to change. You, you don't need for people to change. You have the opportunity to move from crisis to protection by dwelling in a secret place. And when you dwell in that secret place, your mindset changes and your worship changes. And see, that's what we're really talking about all through the month. You know, the, the, the Lord is worried about where's your worship? What are you worshiping? Some of us worship people. Some of us worship the things we have. Um, I, I was having a conversation the other day and was talking about worshiping fear, you know, not worshiping God, but having a mindset of fear and anxiety because of all the things that are going on. You know, where is your worship? You have an opportunity tonight to move from crisis to protection. Tonight, we don't have to wait for the situations to change. We don't have to wait for things to accommodate us or be lined up the way we think. Can, can, can I tell you something? Would you believe that even in your crisis, you're still lined up the way God wants you to be lined up because there's a possibility he's moving you to the left and you're trying to go to the right? So just move from crisis to protection by dwelling in a secret place because there is a secret place, a place where we can spend with God and know that we are in love with him and he loves us that we're protected, that we're watched over, that his wings is covering us. We don't have to be in that place of fear and anxiety or what's going to happen tomorrow. The only thing I'm concerned about is who I'm worshiping today and who I'm serving today. Moving from a place of crisis to protection. I hope you were blessed tonight. I know I truly was blessed tonight. Um, we thank you for participating in our transformation classes for the week, I mean, for the month. Um, um, we thank our captain, 
our team captain, Pastor Angel, and she also participated in the teachings. We thank you. We thank our bishop and all of God's people for participating in our transformation class. And I'm now going to hand it over to our bishop, Jacqueline E. McCullough. Let's put our hands together. This was such a wonderful teaching tonight. And it's a teaching from one of our young men, amen. Amen, breaking it down so that there is no doubt in your mind what's happening. And it's following a, 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 a trail, you know what I'm saying? Or it's making a trail because it's talking about being in the locus, how to come out the locus, and what to do when you come out is, you know, in going in, in the crisis. Why did you get in the crisis in the first place? Why are we going through this? What to do when you're in it? And then when you get out of it, how are you going to respond? And that's what he focused on tonight, the aftermath of the crisis and, and breaking it down. And, and the one thing he kept saying, and I agree with um, Reverend Anthony as well, we're not being delivered to go back to business as usual. He's not bringing us out. That whole thing about, you know, that transactional relationship. In other words, he brought them out. And then after he brought them out, you know, then, then they went right back in it. And, and then they cried, like in the book of Judges, they cried and brought them out, went back in it. But, and sometimes that's the way some of our lives are. He ministers to us, we cry and he opens the door. And then while we, we're enjoying the freedom and the blessing and all of that, we forget to pray. Or we think praying is too much, church is too much, giving is too much, serving is too much. But when we were in trouble, we called him. We want to have that nearness. Because ladies and gentlemen, it's a pandemic today. It could be something tomorrow. It's training our mind. The pandemic should have trained you on how to live a consistent, intimate life with the Lord, no matter what's happening around. That's what this is all about. He sent the locusts. He kept saying, he sent the locusts so that we could repent and we could live a, a life going from glory to glory, from faith to faith from trust to trust, from commitment to commitment, from consecration to consecration. That's what this is all about. Amen. So that when he comes back, we'll be right there. We'll be right there to go back with him. So all that you're going through, all that you've experienced before the pandemic, during the pandemic, and after the pandemic is designed to bring us closer to God. That's the bottom line. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you, Pastor Angel. You all have done a great job in reminding us what really matters. What really matters? It matters because everything that's happening to our lives is to bring us closer to God, closer to God. Less of me and more of him. I might decrease so that he might increase. Somebody says, I can't do that. I'm too special. I'm too bright. I really have too many things going for me to decrease. No, we're, we're not talking about all of the things that he gave you. It's anything that you got going for you, he gave it to you. So it's really not even yours. What he's saying is I want an intimate relationship because you really don't have the answer. You don't know about tomorrow. You don't know about next year. You don't know about tonight. Everything you need is in me. So ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much. Thank you so much again, um, Reverend Anthony. Thank you so much, Reverend Marshall. And of course, Pastor Angel for covering this, this group. It's a wonderful team. We learned so much. And the way he broke down the blessings and Psalm 91, even if you've never read Psalm 91, you can go back and look at that Psalm differently and the different sections of that. And the one thing he can tell you, this is not, um, a, 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 a song where you just pull it out and apply it. No, there are times when it's going to feel like you, you're not in a secret place. There are times when you're going to feel like you're not being rescued. But the psalm promises that if you're faithful and you continue to walk with him, he will, he will honor you, he will rescue you, and he will deliver you. Maybe not on your timetable, maybe the, not the way you want it, you understand? 
because this is not just a cure all, a pla- you know, a plastic application. It's just plastered and it's going to happen the same way all the time. But be assured, he's faithful. Amen. And he will not forsake his own. Just put your hands together and thank God for this wonderful teaching. Amen. And, and thank God that there's another generation that's being raised up that can teach this word. Amen. Another generation. Not all the people, young people out there are, are doing, you know, doing them. And he's not perfect. Nobody's saying he's perfect. But I thank God that he brought a perfect word. He brought a word that's straight from the Bible that anyone can apply. So put your hands together for this team. And at this time, I'm going to ask you to give us unto the Lord. The Lord doesn't need the money, but the church needs your support. So will you give right now in Jesus' name? He brought me out of the miry clay. He placed my feet on a rock to stay. He put a song in my soul today, a song of praise, hallelujah. Oh, he brought me out of the miry clay. He set my feet on a rock to stay. He put a song in my soul today, a song of praise, hallelujah. I'll never be the same again, oh no, no, no. I'll never be the same again, oh no, no, no. Since my life has changed, I am not the same, and I'll never be the same again. Amen, amen. Thank you so much for joining us. Remember, there's a certain kind of attitude and mindset you have to start taking on now. Because when this pandemic shifts, it's shifting. We don't know when we're going to come out of it. And we don't know what's going to be on the back end. But we do know that there is something the Lord is expecting. And that's worship and devotion and obedience and reverence. Worship, devotion, obedience, and reverence. And as a result, we will get the blessings of the Lord. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us. We'll be back here on Friday evening at 8 o'clock. And we certainly hope that you'll come and join us again as we sit around the word of God together. God bless you.